through, can I let the pelvis and the belly, can I let the belly just hang loose? And then for me, another area is the tongue, which is hard for me to do while I'm talking, but essentially soften the tongue. Let it be loose in the mouth. The body becomes a more inviting place when we just let it soften, have that invitation to softening. And once you're skillful enough, then you can just kind of direct all body, soften. And it will. And this doesn't mean that the aches and pains of having a body go away, but we're holding it just softly. And then the next thing I often do, maybe I'm gonna actually step back a little bit. One thing I will do, because I, I feel a little shaky this morning, I will just move the arms, maybe like I'm conducting. Now, it just helps kind of soften. It's hard to be so tense, it's hard to be so rigid if I'm doing something like this. And you can sway or you can just do the hands. And this one works even in lying down meditation. It works. Just to kind of come into the body, soften the space. And then a smiling heart. A lot of times we approach meditation with it determination and rigidness, which I haven't found to be very effective. Uh, if, if it's working for you, I'm not trying to take any method that works away. Uh, this is to add to your toolkit. So the heart, the heart space, perhaps you already have a meta practice where it just radiates and then great, start there. Or you can bring to mind a being or a situation or something that makes the heart smile. Um, my cousin has the most adorable dog that I met. So Sophie, I can bring to mind Sophie in that you know, puppy face. And my heart just goes, oh, yes. So this smiling heart, feet grounded on the floor, heart smiling, open. And then the last thing I do for a preparation is, uh, just like we did in the, the chant, a radiating, and a radiating in all directions. So there it was talking about the four directions above and below, so we could do that. Just pick a direction, and that smiling heart out. So I'm picking to the front. And the smiling heart to one of your sides. And the smiling heart out to the back. Smiling heart to the other side. Above. And below. And everywhere. So for me, this preparation helps me to really feel centered and grounded and ready to meet my meditation object with much more openness, kindness, love. So you can choose to do this meditation standing or I'm going to go back to a sitting posture. And see if in the transition to your seat, you can keep that open, steady, welcoming presence. Hmm. Making any of those adjustments that it feel welcoming to be in this body for this time of practice. Again, checking the disposition of the pelvis, the belly, be soft and relaxed. So 
a posture that allows the air to flow freely. And I know we've had a number of illnesses going around that constrict and there's maybe breathing issues. So as freely as your body has today, it's just, how does it feel right now? Can I soften around how it is right now? And again, the tongue and the jaw. Let the tongue just be loose in the mouth. And I'm not going to suggest any particular meditation object. I know that each of you probably has one that's you know, your, your sweet relationship. So go to that sweet relationship with whatever your meditation object is. And if it hasn't been a sweet relationship, open to the possibility of that. open to a deep appreciation for this object, the breath, the body scan, metta, casino, whatever you're using. Just before you really begin, notice the relationship. And if there's any tension in that relationship, that's a hindrance. And you can just see it as that. It's a hindrance. And have a relationship with that hindrance until it's free and open. And the door is there to be with your meditation object sweetly and gently. We've got about 15 minutes where we can come into relationship. And if it takes the whole time just to come into relationship, it's well spent. And then once you're with your object of meditation, continue to be in loving regard. This is something that's often missed. We'll all be quiet so we can each have our sweet relationship with our meditation object.
but I'm not done to share something I've been on with. Um, well, as always, I'd like to start with the, the homage to the Buddha, uh, whose teachings make it possible for us to experience life differently, make it possible to open the heart to things that society says are not supposed to be looked at. So we'll start with Namatasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa Dutang Tamang Sangam Namasa Well, I think I should start a little bit with my social location so you know, of course you can't pinpoint because it is all changing these identity things, but current social location. Um, so I would, would be just entering the middle years of monastic life, Majima. So I've been ordained as a bhikkhuni for five years. Uh, before that, I was a novice for two and an anagarika for one. So the, the, the new hairdo came about eight years ago. Um, and previous to this morning, um, all of the Dhamma sharing and um, retreat facilitation types things that I've done have been in the context of the monasteries I've been at. So this is the first time I'm putting on you know, this equipment and all of this. Uh, so middle years in the forest traditions often are the start of visiting other places, learning a little bit more about the, the wider world of Buddhism, uh, what's happening in other monasteries, and this is the first stop. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. That also being said, I get to fall back on the Buddha saying, listen and decide for yourself, because I'm in the process. I'm in process of becoming a monastic becoming and not becoming, <laughs> to be, not be. I'm in the process of that exploration. So I will do my best to share with you what I've learned from the Buddhist teachings, from my teachers, and from my own practice. But I didn't plan for this talk, although I did hear that it's okay to plan for talks. So I, I thought about it in the five minutes since I heard that. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. So I do ask you to take this as a facilitation and exploration and look for yourself. Um, it's a clear space where you kind of know you got permission because I'm no expert, uh, but take it into all of your Buddhist practice. Look for yourself. And uh, Ajahn Misabo suggested maybe talking about pilgrimage, but I think we'll save that for them who actually, and you who actually have been on pilgrimage most recently. I'm just about to start mine, not yet in the uh, lands of Buddhism, but the other social location I have is as a convert Buddhist, you know, not something that I had the good fortune to grow up with. So I met it. Um, I, I heard about it, you know, back in college, and I picked up the meditation because that was really supportive. Uh, but it wasn't until my 40s that I actually met Buddhism. So I own that I don't have that whole heritage, but you get a pretty good crash course when you put the ropes on. So I'll bring that today too. And then the other social location, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a white bodied. Um, convert Buddhist. So there's a whole lot of the cultural heritage that I also haven't experienced. 
and my social location within the United States has given me some aspects of privilege that I also haven't had to deal with some of the dukkha, the suffering that uh, my friends in darker bodies have experienced. Uh, another social location is I'm non-binary and non-binary monastic in a bhikkhuni form. And so I get to unpack those identities too. Um, and then that one that Ajahn Misabo mentioned, I come from a background of science and data systems. <laughs> so my mind had been very much in that world of uh, what is the shape of things? How do I codify and define and make some, you know, I should have gone into the Abhidhamma, you would think, because I was you know, very meticulous in how do I say this is a that? and I worked in control systems. So I tell you some of these things to uh, locate me in this moment of sharing and also to be able to own why I do this embodiment practice. I do it because a lot of my social driving was toward um, a rigidity of structures, a following of the rules, a definition, a be right and succeed and then do the next best good thing. So my uncle was potentially gonna be here, is he? I, uh, I yay. Okay, so Uncle Max, old, oldest sister is my mom. And I had a conversation with her early in my career, you know, probably s still in graduate school, had a full-time job as a research scientist. And I said, hi, mom, I just did, da da da, I don't even remember what it is I did, da 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 da, -da. I just accomplished this. And she says, oh, that's wonderful, and you know, so she wants to celebrate, and I'm like, yeah, 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 and next I'm going to. You know, I didn't even pause. It was like, next, I'm going to have this patent. I'm going to uh, start this. I'm going to, you know, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next, I'm going to. And there was a pause on the phone. And she said, oh, sweetheart, you might be happy in life, but you'll never be content. And I received it kind of like a splash of cold water, but with so much, there was so much love in that statement and so much concern for me that it took me years to like work on it, but that, that little message, sweetheart, you'll never be content. You might be happy, but you'll never be content, struck with me. And it struck, stuck with me through the striving and the striving and the striving. So, I'm not really going into the topic of pilgrimage. Um, but for me, starting a pilgrimage, I need to look at that attitude. That attitude, of the, the Buddha definitely said, strive on, strive on with diligence. But he also gave us so many tools for doing it gently, for holding it gently. And that's where I wanna focus as I start my, you know, out into the world and I'd love to hear from others who were on that pilgrimage, how this might have impacted them. I, I saw one person here, Daniel, who lost his luggage. <laughs> and you know, it's just, Ajahn Kovalev was like, wow, you know, your demeanor is pretty awesome for someone who's just lost their luggage. It's not arrived yet. And I noticed that on the train ride up with the passengers I was with, there were those who were happy to be on this crowded train you know, with all of its sensations and relations and things, the very same train and other people were quite miserable. You know, and it was how they were holding it. There were people who were holding it gently and there were people who were holding it tightly and there were people who were holding it tightly and changed. So that's possible too. My seatmate was one of those. After, apparently it was his third attempt to get back to Portland uh, the, tra the plane didn't work, the bus stranded him in Sacramento, he, you know, da 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 
but you know, after sharing some a meal and having a conversation and realizing we'd read so many of the same books and you know, it just could be a softer, gentler way of holding that same experience. So how do we bring this into our practice? I'd like to do another little embodiment experiment. Uh, this one I learned from, uh, the, the, what I did previously, I learned from Paul Linden, an Aikido master who works on peace building in the world. And this one I learned from Stacy Haynes, who works on um, uh, social justice and particularly uh, undoing the societal structure that brings about sexual abuse of children. And one of her exercises is, and you're welcome to try it if you want, take a, make a fist, nice and tight. So you've got your fist, nice and tight. And you know, sometimes we go into meditation just like this. Now, we, wanna, we don't want this fist. This, we know that this is just pain. Try to, un, try to open that fist. Try to take that other hand and open that fist. Okay. So let's shake that. Okay, now make the fist again, nice and tight. Mm. Now with your other hand, rest, hold the fist that's tight. Just let the fist have a place to rest. I see some fists softening. Does anyone have a word or two? What are they experiencing? Someone just shout it out. Comfort. Release. Kindness. Ease. Okay, I, and you know, mine's still continuing to unfurl. Which approach is most effective? I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna change. I'm gonna understand this whole Buddhist thing and be enlightened. <laughs> or I'm gonna be with, I'm gonna be with this tightness, the tightness in the heart, tightness in the body, the tightness in the mind. I'm gonna be with it. I'm gonna see it, I'm gonna hold it, I'm gonna let it be, and then there's space. So I guess maybe, let's see, midway into the talk, can you give it a title? Um, how you hold it matters. How you hold it matters. And I think as you read, I often like to have suttas that I'll reference and um, you know, in the process of packing and transmitting, I, I didn't do that background to be able to give you a particular reference number, but I'm quite sure that during our discussion, people can bring something forth, either from up here or out there or online. How you hold it matters. And some of that has to do with our intention or intentionality, how we approach. And early on when I came to monastic life, well actually even before, I wrote to Ayasobhana, who was one of the forest teachers uh, uh, at uh, Aranyabodhi, where I was first between Dhammadrini Monastery and Aranyabodhi, they're this, the same organization. And I asked her what I should be doing in preparation <laughs> for monastic life. You know, what suttas should I have memorized, what should I, you know, Okay, it's, it's still, I'm still working on it, you can tell, that easing off and being with. And she wrote back, um, let's see if I can remember it now. Be as gentle, calm, and kind as you possibly can, and I don't have the wording quite right now, but, and, and guard your morality, your sila, your ethics. So living from an ethical place, uh, that's going to put you in really good stead to enter monastic life. It's going to put you in really good stead to enter anything. 
but the gently, calmly, kindly. No, I, I don't, she, she claimed later she didn't even remember writing it, so you know, I don't know that it was a personal thing or anything, but it really landed for me. I put it on my altar at home, gently, calmly, kindly. And then as I entered monastic life, I asked Paloka, the uh, senior teacher at Donna Dorini, uh, gave me a teaching on how to relate. And I do this, how I relate with the suttas, how I relate with other people. And finally, I'm starting to learn how to relate with myself in my meditation practice. And she recommended you see it, and she was using the Brahma Viharas. You see it with the Brahma Viharas, and the Brahma Viharas are metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, which is loving kindness or loving friendliness, compassion, the gladness resonant, and the equanimity, which is the, the chant that we did at the beginning. So I thought I'd bring that in. So using these Brahma Viharas as the basis how do I see? How do I see? How do I actually, how do I see? How do I look out and meet the world as I'm seeing these people, some who are new, some I've met before, some I probably met in previous lives. Oh, what am I, how am I seeing? Am I doing it from this place of Brahma Viharas? And I morphed it a little bit to bring in Ayasobhana's gently, calmly, kindly, which I ended up mapping, which we could talk about next summer if you're interested, to right intention, the intentionality, the way that I reach into the Dhamma and the relationship and my experience. So can I see things gently, calmly, kindly? And then the next is how do I receive them? How do I, you know, act with contact, the seeing and the seeing, just the seeing, and then there's the receiving it, and then, you know, something starts to happen as it comes into my space, my mental space, my heart space, my body space. Am I receiving it gently, calmly, kindly? So I'm going to really work on this as I go out into the world. Am I seeing it? Am I receiving it gently, calmly, kindly? And then holding. Am I holding it gently, calmly, kindly? The Buddha suggests that we actually look at things, you know, in the beginning, before we act, then as we're acting, and then after we've acted. So this is beginning to act. How am I holding it? Is it gently, calmly, kindly? And then finally, how do I respond? Gently, calmly, kindly. So that's uh, one, one, of the, one of the ways that I bring the Brahma Viharas, bring right intention, bring gentleness into the whole flow of relationship. And embodiment has been a big part of being able to show up. So I, I use the voice, I use a chanting to help me just over and over and over. So this one, you can kind of imagine me going through the forest, up to my kuti, back, you know, moving around, doing, doing the chores. May I see gently, calmly, kindly. May I receive gently, calmly, kindly. May I hold gently, calmly, kindly. May I respond gently, calmly, kindly. And when I would play this over and over in my head or voice it into the forest, it really helps reset. I, I also, I confess my social location is from a lot of anxiety. Um, I just, throughout my life, that has been one of the, you know, pick, on, pick your favorite hindrance. Mm, yeah, that's one's mine. 
So this matter of using the voice, using movement, really helps me to set myself up for right relationship. And I don't, I, I didn't really get into any of the suttas and things because it's, uh, I, I can't get my mind right into that today. So maybe I'll open it up at this point that we can either bring in some suttas or we can bring in some lived experience of what is it to approach whatever you're working with internally, externally. And is there some gentleness, some kindness in it? Or is there something else that works for you? Bring that in too. So thank you. Checking, checking, okay. Checking, checking, okay. So uh, you can, I still turn that on a bit. This, I think we turned the volume down on this one a little bit. I think that it should be all right if it's on, yeah. I think there was the issue, it was this. Um, so I, if you wanted to, you know, people who want to respond to Aya's prompt can. We just need a mindful mic walker. disposition, how do you, you know, see, hold, respond, so anything, open up. <laughs> I just wanted to respond to thank you for sharing your chant. Um, chanting is something that really resonates with me, but I hadn't considered developing my own chants, and so that is a lovely example. Um, and I will take it with me today, so thank you. That's wonderful. It's truly made a difference for me uh, because I would hold it's so right much. Time. Oops. All right. It's got a green light. All right. It's very low. For some reason. I'll, I'll just speak up, or I don't know if that'll do anything for the people it's online, though. Good it's good enough? All right. Yeah. I'll do a combo of speaking up. Uh, so, so yes, it's made a very big difference for me because of that anxiety disposition. I hold a lot in the body, and for the resonance of voice, so you can use drumming or you can use uh, movement or you know those sorts of things can help physically move and reset, and it can help me reset a tight mind by picking words that. So I, I take the Dhammapada verses, I take uh, the teachings I receive from my teachers, whatever it is that can be s turned into my, my personal mantra for a while and share it out. And it can be a meditation practice too. So. <laughs> Okay, I, I also wanted to share that, that, that your, your chant, I'm gonna take that with me as well. Because I noticed that you know, when the energy rises, it, you know, there's gotta be a way to bring it back down again and to remember the sila in the moment when, you know. And I also use sangha, and uh, yeah, I, I, I love sangha. I don't think I could do this without sangha. And um, um, so, yeah, I, thank you for your talk. Yeah, it's really and reading suttas. Um, 
just a lot of different, lots of different teachers and just lots of coming in, but there's so much that's, there's a, there's a flow through it all that, um, that's more and more apparent to me. Anyway. And Sangha is incredibly important to mm-hmm. build up when we're, when we're practicing alone, if, if we're using a voice, a solo voice can be, you know, something beautiful, but when it begins to resonate and reverberate within community, then we're really actually changing. We came back from a retreat, a 30-day retreat, and there were, I think it was five of us on the plane coming back from a 30-day retreat, flying down back to San Francisco, and we said, okay, we're going to do meta on this plane. Yeah, we weren't we weren't chanting, we weren't you know, we weren't, but we're just doing that on this plane. And I like to think that, you know, there was a, a palpable difference by practicing as multiple bodies within a space. You know, and then of course we have to go do that isolation in the forest, uh, secluded the tree, go inside and get comfortable there too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say how much I appreciated um, the way you began the meditation with the the sort of prompt to sort of radiate outward in all directions. Mm -hmm. And I found that I could be so sort of sweetly and softly in the body once I had done that, that that it's so much easier to be in the body when you sort of remember that you aren't confined Mm -hmm. in the body in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, it just was, it was very sweet. It was a very sweet practice. I felt like I could have stayed there forever and, um, and just a reminder to to not be so rigid was really beautiful. Thank you. I, I had to come to that by what I call my meta accident. <laughs> well, I really like the Uh, prompt of how you hold it matters and certainly it's the case with that mic um, (laughs) this mic as well Um, but yeah thinking about that in terms of suttas and uh, it's a kind of a neat little exercise for people who have like explored the suttas and had like four different you know similes of holding things that came up in the suttas that that do involve like the skill in holding and also uh, like the softness of metta. So one of them is just this simile of like holding like a baby chick. So this is a simile of like how you hold your meditation object. If you grab the chick too tightly or if you grasp and clench down on your, your breath or whatever your meditation object is, it's just going to constrict and won't work. But then if you hold too loosely, you're just going to fall asleep and the chick's going to fly away. Uh, another one is with uh, a simile of like an, a carpenter's awl. So you've got this, this tool and the carpenter's using the tool, using the awl like every day. And you look at it after one day and you, it just looks like the same old awl. But if you come back after 20 years, you can actually see the, the grip. You can see the, the hold, uh, like you can see the fingerprints almost on the awl. Or like the Bathman's Apprentice, you know, the, this is a simile for, for Jhana, you know, the, the Bathman's Apprentice, he takes, um, <laughs> obviously I don't have the skill in holding this, this mic, but um, uh, yeah, gently, calmly, kindly, thank you. Um, basically, the Bathman's Apprentice takes like these flakes of soap and then just kneads them together such that the, uh, 
ball of soap is drenched, steeped, filled, and pervaded with water, but it doesn't ooze out. And uh, that's another one of these phrases, drenched, steeped, filled, and pervaded. Uh, it comes up again and again in uh, the different, um, different suttas about uh, how to fill your body and just uh, fill your body with, um, with joy and with rapture that can come from meditation. And the final simile is with uh, regards to like a conch shell. And so this is like uh, just as someone who's going to be, uh, say like a watchman, goes up to the top of a mountain and holds the, the conch shell and they're going to blow and they blow the conch and it pervades in every direction. Um, so too you can practice loving kindness, but if you don't know how to play a conch shell, you know, it's just going to, yeah, it's just, just blow and blow and it uh, doesn't do anything. So you have to practice blowing in the, the right way. So, um, yeah, cool, cool prompt. Um, I don't know if it's going to be, if anybody else is going to have more skill with uh, holding this thing, but um, it would be nice to have. Maybe. Yeah, let's try that. Testing. Thank you so much. I really appreciated your talk and the uh, also the opening up to meditation. That really helped. Um, with my meditation object and and I wanted to ask you how the and I'm pretty new to this uh, tradition I just wanted to ask how the doctrine of not self comes into play when you are in relationship to people the world and yourself <laughs> we'll see how that works Okay, I would throw the question back at you with when you go into a relationship with a big sense of self and identity, how well do you do? Mm -hmm. So right there. <laughs> Not self in relationship to everything. It's again, it's the holding. If I'm attached to me being me, I just gotta be me, I gotta, gotta do me. And I've got a definition of what that me is gonna be. I mean, yeah, I gave you my social identity at the beginning to place me within you know, our society. And it's just a, a marker to kind of know where something is coming from. But if you identify it, or I identify it, is that's me, I am, am a this, then I'm tight. Whereas if it's like, that's my conditioning I've been conditioned with this identity, de identification, rightly, wrongly. This is how I perceive me at this moment. This is how others have perceived me. This is what the world is relating to me as. Then it's much more, I'm holding conditionality. And there's also then the invitation for things to be as they are and to change as they change. And I'm not attached to that identity being just thus then. You know, it, it can change, it can be fluid, it can flow. And when I'm open to that not selfing, as opposed to I gotta be me, what we do in relationship is held very, very differently. It can be gentle and calm and kind because I don't, I don't need it to be something for me to be okay. So that's my working with not self at this time. And we have a we have somebody from Zoom who has a question. Oh, I wanted to hear more not self, <laughs> but I'm not attached to it. <laughs> no, wait, you want you go first, and then the person on Zoom. We have time. Let's go to Zoom. That sounds great. Okay. <laughs> so. 
So, Mary. Hello. Um, welcome back, Ajans. And hello again, Aya. How nice to see you. I don't know if you remember our visit while you were in Spokane. Yeah. So good to visit you, uh, see you again, and to hear your Dhamma, which was so beautiful. And um, I think one of the parts, well, it all really spoke to me, but I love the putting it all into relationship because to me, that has always been where I found Dhamma is in relationship, how, to, how we relate to ourselves and to others. And that it's, that relationship is so responsive in the moment. That's one way I can get the, the unconditionality of things is the movement within the relationship is, of what's happening. And your chant that you sang to yourself is a beautiful thing to bring into, well, each moment. And uh, I just want to appreciate, I just want to extend my appreciation for your dedication over these years. I mean, I knew you more in the beginning as well. And and to hear, hear this beautiful Dhamma coming from you now as you are in your middle years of exploring. But I just, well, I think the thing I really want to add the most is this, this relationship, re looking at how we relate to everything with the Brahma Viharas is in my, at my level of practice, the heart of it. So I thank you for your words. Thank you. I, I think you maybe were helping me get around in Spokane when I was just a brand new bhikkhuni. It's true, you were. Yeah. You were. We went up to um, the Abbey and we had, you had coffee at Gonzaga, Gozads. And uh, yeah, so it was fun. Uh, that's wonderful. And I, yes, you bring in that important thing, the same thing, the, the Sangha, you know, the, bringing that in. The, the thing is that when we're approaching relationships and we do it with this gentle, calm kind, uh, well, th there's a lot of benefit to that. It's not always going to be necessarily gentle, calm, and kind in, in, in that relationship. The, the, just the nature of being human beings. Uh, my Dhamma teacher from before monastic life, Mark Nunberg, at Common Ground, he would describe it as, you need to be in community so you've got the rubbing and the scrubbing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I say, yes, we have the Brahma Viharas and the gentle, calm, and kind, because what we're up against is, is going to be like that rock tumbler. I mean, if, if the Buddha had had that, uh, image at his time, I'm sure it would be one of the similes, uh, as the rock tumbler is what it is to be in Sangha, even with those who are all doing their best to practice wise sila ethical conduct. Uh, there is going to be rubbing and scrubbing because we haven't all gotten to that not self where it's all, you know, just conditionality, got a lot of attachment. So yeah, it's wonderful to see you again slightly here through the through the chair on the screen, but. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, it's my first time coming today, and I've been hearing a lot about this from my friends. So um, it was. It was really special to have the uh, the opening embodiment part because um, just in my experience, in my experience, I have a very serious movement practice that I spend a lot of hours of my life doing, and I notice when I do it before my sets because I also meditate two hours most most days. The difference is almost like night and day. The the depth and calmness with which I'm able to meditate when I do an hour or m more or even less of movement before meditating. It's like changes everything. And so to offer that even short time to the whole group here, I just, that really was wonderful. Um, 
And the other thing I wanted to, to add, and a, a question that just came to me a few minutes ago was also the voice element as another way to get into the body is also so powerful. And I haven't, I work with my voice too, but not near as much as my movement work, but it's just another way where you really can come into the body. So I also always wanted to learn some chanting and use that, but I haven't. So, you know, for a lot of reasons, it feels daunting. And, but the idea of just whatever, however you need to do that for yourself, in addition to if you want to learn and explore that more. Um, so that was that also that invitation of creating a chant, using the voice as another way to get into the body. Um, I very much appreciate it. So thank you. All right. Well, maybe I'll share one more then um, chant that actually that I took the title from or made up in the middle. OK. So this one was, I was having a really tough time. Um, it's just like I kept stepping in it and stepping in it and stepping in it. And I was like, okay, what, how can I approach this? So I actually brought that sweetheart back from my mom. Sweetheart, hold it gently. Sweetheart, I know you care. How you hold it matters. Please be aware. Sweetheart, hold it gently. Sweetheart, I know you care. How you hold it matters. Please be aware. And that brings me back into presence. Please be aware. Was the best post jet lag uh, chant to calm me down ever. Aya, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Aya, for everything and for coming and joining us. And we look forward to having you for a long time this summer and uh, for all those chants, especially. We will have a chance for um, you to practice chanting this evening if you're interested. We're doing 108 ETPs which are a bit different than this chant, um, but, uh, and awesome. Two hours of awesome, a whole night. <laughs> so uh, if you're here and um, are interested, um, after we wrap up, we'll at 5, thir or 7 p.m. Uh, I'll be gathering at Fauntleroy Church down in West Seattle, and um, we'll have a evening of Dhamma talks, meditation, um, a traditional long uh, series of chants of homage to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And um, we'll have two available nap rooms for those who want, and also coffee. So if you come and um, you can stay up as long as you want, and then if you want to sort of turn in, you can uh, just um, sort of, you don't have to drive home in the early hours, we'll have a place for you to, to stay. Um, do bring blankets and maybe a sleeping pad or something of that sort. Um, yeah, and I just want to take this opportunity to welcome Ajahn Kovilo here. So uh, we haven't had Ajahn for a few months, and um, we get him for about three more weeks here, uh, three, two more Saturdays. So we're very grateful, Ajahn, for you joining us. Thank you. And um, this evening we'll also have a chance for uh, the... 30, well, 30 com community members just went on pilgrimage to Thailand and India, hence the general feeling of jet lag amongst some of the people here. And um, some at midnight tonight or 12.30 a.m. will be sharing a bit about that uh, and we'll have other opportunities for them to kind of share.